I didn't read a lot of reviews for Crazy Rich Asians. You did not go on Reddit. I definitely did not go on Reddit. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a very, very, very special episode of Fun Bros Food. We drove all the way from the 626 to West LA. We never do this. Guys, today we are sitting down eating some delicious Sichuan food with the director of Crazy Rich Asians, John M. Chu. We're gonna talk about everything from Asian identity to Asian food, just how just he how to, came up. How to be successful in a field that a lot of people would probably not bet that a lot of Asian Americans would be successful in. All right, so we're here at Sichuan Impression, one of the most famous and authentic Sichuan restaurant chains. Man, we got a lot to talk about. Sichuan food with John M. Chu. Let's, Let's go. go. Yo, John, thank you so much for doing this. Today we're at Sichuan Impression. Yes. You're hungry? I'm starving. Half your family's from Sichuan? Yep, my father. He has a restaurant in the Bay Area called Chef Chu's. What was like special about your dad's restaurant or how you guys did things that made it so successful? I think it was my parents. I think it's literally the personalities of my dad loves to host people and he loves to entertain. Like he he's out there with the guests. I there. see him in the, all the pictures. Oh, yeah. No, he seems like he comes out and he greets most people, right? Yeah, he loves to greet and he loves to cook. If anything I learned about passion and consistency and hard work was from my mom and my dad. Like, he would draw his dishes before he ever made his dishes. And Yo, like, so he storyboards right. his, his <laughs> recipes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember one time I was there with my friend and it was after like a, a sports practice and we're eating. And I said, oh, a waiter to my dad. And he came over and like slapped me. And was like, <sighs> don't ever treat me like that. Don't ever talk down to me right, like that. Right, right. And I think there is a respect to service. There is like, he's doing this not to uh, serve people, but to um, meet eyes with them. Wow, you went for it. Yeah. Or is this for me? What, you want rose or you want watermelon? That doesn't matter to me. I'll... Yo, that looks even. This is like something out of CRA. This, this is, is amazing, amazing. yes, it's great. Department. So you were saying that your dad did not look at it like he was serving in a, like a hierarchical, like down way. You're saying yeah. he was doing it to create good vibes. He said, if you ever, you know, when people, say things to you or treat you in a certain way. Like you can spend your energy trying to like correct them or fight that thing. But at a certain point, like you just have to show them and prove them wrong. I know I'm the youngest of three. Yeah. David's the middle, first boy, we got an oldest sister. Did that help you pursue that career of going into movies where you're like, you know what, I'm the fifth kid. That's a lot of kids. My, yeah, they all went to UCLA. My bro oldest brother uh, is now taking over the restaurant. One, he's like way cooler than me. He's like, all my friends want to be friends with me to be friends with him. Uh, and then you put the heaviness of family and expecting him to, to carry those forward. I think he had a lot more pressure on him than I ever did. They had paved the path for me, for sure. So I got to think about other things than my cultural identity. You didn't think so much about your cultural identity that much on the way up until, yeah. especially recently. Yeah, I would say, I mean, nice. until college, I'd never, I mean, I'd run into little things here and there, but nothing that um, disturbed my whole identity. Anything that would jolt me, I think uh, my mom and dad had such a presence in this, in this community that um, it would wash away very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you were still one of the only Asians at that school though, right? Um, yes, and, and as I went on, more and more arrived. Uh, you know, my sister, she went to UCLA and it was the first time she, she got spit on the face, in the face, in Westwood, by some woman who said, go back to your country. You know? And my sister is like super shy and does not like, is like so Doesn't kind, provoke so that Does not provoke. Does, I felt for her, I right, felt right, right. So you, you experienced her. it a little bit yourself, but also through your family members yeah. and other people. Like, but as you got older, you, got you, older. you, yeah, you would sure. hear yeah. the stories, For right? sure, for sure. I had gotten used to just like someone yelling at something at me. I'm like, I'm just keep going. Could, could I ask you what yeah. they were yelling or uh, something it was along a, the lines? It was along the lines of something, chink, something, go to, back to your country. I mean, it's so sounds, like, sounds about right. not creative <laughs> in any sort of way. My girlfriend at the time had never experienced that before. And she was like, what the fuck did you just say? And she, she, she's white. Yeah, she's white, okay. Uh, and so she got to her face and was like so mad. Right. And I had to like pull her away and be like, oh, you've never, <laughs> you, right, know, right, you, right. you don't get this. At <laughs> some point, I had to face what that meant about yeah. how I felt about myself or how it, that affected my own identity, not just cultural identity, my own self-worth. Uh, I did one movie, a student film, that dealt with it called Guaylo. Um, and it was so hard for me to make that, that I never 
I never really showed anyone. It was, and, and it was a musical and it was a fun little thing, but like, I didn't know if, I, if, if it would make my parents sad. I didn't know if I had the right answers. Did it feel like you were kind of complaining? You were like, I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna yeah. come off as that guy to be like, oh, it's so hard. Yeah, I also felt that for sure. That was mixed in there, yeah. oh, thank you. You know, there's like pros and cons of yeah. like, um, powering through, whether it's intense racism or yeah. light racism or medium level racism, I'm sure every Asian American deals with it different because they're just born into a different world. I guess one th question I wanted to ask you, because one thing that I, I have come across, especially for a lot of Asian dudes, when they're like, they have risen really high in a world that a lot of people wouldn't think that an Asian guy could rise high in, is they do take a similar approach. Everybody handles it a different way, right? Like some people are like Eddie Huang about it and they're like fight fire with fire. Yeah. And some people more brush it off or they like, finessing it, and some people are just broken by it. Yeah. How do you weigh the pros and cons? Or are you just like, man, it's just on an individual basis? Like, I mean, for me, there, everyone has to deal with survival in their own way. That's just on a human level, not just an Asian American level. Especially this generation of Asian Americans, which was really not defined. I didn't even know that was really a thing, like what an Asian American really means as a, uh, culturally or, or what, who we are until meeting others uh, along the way throughout the years. And I think we're all doing this together. So I, there's no right answer. Like my way is only the way I did because I had to do, I had to figure out how to survive. My evolution is the fact that, oh, I feel more comfortable speaking up now, which maybe I was cowardly before. And now because of the internet, because of people sharing their experiences, I feel like, oh no, when I say something, I'm not crazy. And I can actually help other people in that and they can help me because I feel uh, supported on the other side. But how do you figure this out? How do you, is it, is it kind of based on your career? Like maybe obviously going into movies in Hollywood, you're like, maybe naturally I'm not the most combative type and also it's probably not gonna help my career at first to be that. I think it all depends on what you want. Most people don't even ask themselves or have an answer to, or don't take the time to figure out what do you want in your life. I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. I knew I needed the microphone to speak and to, to, to express uh, myself. And I need to go as straight a line as possible because I wanted to do it quickly. And so you were on a mission, you had, I was I like, I'm trying to make it. Yeah, that's it for me. To be the best filmmaker or storyteller, you have to focus on being the best filmmaker or storyteller, which means I gotta make stuff. That's the only thing I can do. And so anything that would detract from that journey was not essential to me. Mm -hmm. As being the youngest of five, you don't get heard, you're sort of lost, but film gave me a voice that um, I felt uh, gave me uh, something to live for. And I love working with people to create that thing. Um, is that why a lot of your stuff always involves like a bunch of people? Like, I was just, <laughs> you, I you watched that student film that you did was a musical, <laughs> yes. and I was like, yo, there's already like 60 people in yes, this. Yes, there's a lot of this. You, you make some life. tapestries. Yeah. <laughs> to me, the secret sauce is like, um, when you surround yourself with the most talented people, of course you're gonna discover things. You have to be open to hear and to listen to your film as it starts to come to life. If people didn't think I had something to say, then I would make something that showed them I have something to say. And if people didn't think I could handle a bigger crew, I would make something with a bigger crew. Maybe, maybe that comes from a sense of trying to prove myself. I don't know the, uh, the deep, dark uh, realms where that comes from, but I like the challenge. I like it as um, proof that we can be anything that we wanna be if we study hard and put our minds and, and, um, and, and power behind it. So when someone says I can't do anything, like that's the first time, that's, that's usually the beginning of a new project where I'm like, right. bring right. it, let's go. What do you think, cause you know, you, you said you made that student film Guaylo yes. in USC. Um, how come it seems like, it seems like a lot of the Asian American film community can't get past their Guaylo. Yeah. They're like still making it yeah. over and over and over again because that's why every Asian film festival has <laughs> like 45 it. movies <laughs> that are essentially longer versions yeah. of Guaylo. Yeah. How'd you get past it? Should we get past it? Can you see why they can't? One, I don't blame them. I blame the circumstance of having to go through that and having a way so heavily in you that you feel like you need to show people or share it. I think we have not had the opportunity to go beyond that because we haven't even had the first base to express those things. So even though we have seen that short film over and over again, the amount of scripts out there about um, being first generation Asian American and going through that same, it's like so many. As time goes on, this, the next step for those, what's the next conversation? Like we're here already. We don't have to, uh, uh, we don't have to explain why we're here or, or, or what we're doing here. Now we get to explain what we are. That next wave of stories, which is why I'm excited for this next generation, because I think they're on it. And I think they will show us uh, ways of how to express that with not, without going 
to those same spots. But I do think Crazy Rich Asians um, spoke on a different level because we dealt with those things without dealing without doing that story. It was essentially an American story because it was an American girl who represents the philosophies of America going to Asia for the first time and feeling both at home and out of home. That to me was what I felt growing up. Even though I wasn't crazy rich Asian, I was um, going to school every day um, and trying to balance these two philosophies that I was taught for uh, Caucasian people who had never had a hero represent their values, she becomes their hero, even though she may not look like them. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing, just to show, like, this is, this is what it means to be Asian American in this world. You're saying that the, the non-Asian audiences are rooting for Rachel's character. Yeah. Right. And not, there's no, because there isn't another Caucasian character that can, like, you have to, like, side with in any sort of way, it puts you on our side because that's who we are. No, she so. is American and, and I could totally see her being relatable. It, it actually makes more sense now even that you said that. Yeah. I'm like, the reason why generations will never really see eye to eye because each generation, it skips every generation. So a generation came here um, from chaos to find security. So they made food, they got us food, they got us shelter and they gave us love. And then we get into security and love. We're like, this is boring. I want chaos. So we go to chaos. And they're like, why are you going to chaos? Mm. We literally just got safety for you. Why are you going over yeah, And we're just like, the second generation. Yeah. They're like, we just made it. It's a privilege to actually now fight for some of the things that we get to fight for because uh, we, because our parents paved the way gave us a platform, gave us the safety and security to step up. Would you say almost like reaching a level where there's a balance between chaos and stability and you get to choose within your life growing up that that might be like kind of a level of privilege that we might reach in the future. But right now we're still, it seems like we're choosing between one or the other. We're choosing between the STEM job and then we're choosing between going into entertainment. Oh God, you know, and then it's just like, you know, I hopefully our kids or you, uh, maybe your kid will get to choose, right? Yeah. I think the reality is everything is chaos. Some people just see it as more safe than others, but the reality is the world is the world. Anything can happen at any point. Where do you want to put your energy? Where do you want to end up? You know, when I make movies, uh, there is other directors who are angry on set, yelling on set, and they get everything they want. And then for me, I would love to get everything I want. But at the same time, I don't, I think my existence as a human being and having um, an energy around me that we love what we're doing and that we're gonna survive this up and down battle that we'll go through our whole life and, 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 and love each other with that. Like to me, that's, I, I prioritize that over my art in a weird way. Uh, but when you, when you do look at everybody as having a life and having their own thing, it makes you treat them differently and I choose that beyond anything else. So. Is that very Asian? Cause like, you know who, uh, you know Andrew Chow, right? The, the owner of Boba Guys, he, yeah. he always tells me, I'm sort of like a new style of like CEO and maybe it is, it is informed by being yeah. Asian. I'm a Harmony CEO, which is very in sharp contrast to your, you know, your ultra alpha shout you down. Is it at all driven by that? I actually think it's the mix that makes that possible. Being taught growing up that you have to work hard and then also getting run over a couple times as well at the same time. And your kindness invites people trying to take advantage all the time. Right, it's, it's interpreted as weakness. Yeah. In exactly. a lot of Asian culture, yeah. If you're too nice, yeah. they see it as weakness. For sure. Right. Well, yeah, in, in, in a lot of cultures. Any, any in a lot of culture, culture. Uh, You step onto a set and the moment, if I, if, at this moment everyone feels too comfortable, the work gets worse, and then <laughs> you, have to, you have a lot harder fight to fight. Ultimately, but I also think that um, when I think of leaders that empower people and inspire people to uh, be proud of their work, buying into a message you're trying to communicate empowers everyone to be better, and I think that is just as effective. And yeah, you know what? You're going to have to deal with some people who take, try to take advantage of you because there's assholes out there. But you know what? I can be an asshole when I need to be an asshole to the asshole. So I think it's the mix. Again, uh, I think partly it is a, a, a maybe a Chinese thing, but also in a, an environment where everyone's telling you you won't make it. All those things, when they build up on you and you realize they don't mean anything, it, it really changes your brain to know that you're in control of the space you want your life to be in. And, and, and I think that was only possible through finding it through all the things that informed me growing up, if that makes sense. I was listening to you talk, but I also saw you eat. And I noticed that you went for the, when we put the liver on your, you ate the liver first. I was surprised, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, Josh, down. Uh, yeah, I'm down. I love eating everything. I gotta ask this question. What do you think about, you know how you said people come for you on Twitter? And people come for you on Reddit? And you recently directed Ken Jong's special. Asian haters on the internet, they're the fucking worst, dude. White trolls are bad, but Asian trolls, they're the stickiest, dude. I think the guys on the internet are kind of like in, this really weird position because 
you see a lot of things that you're unhappy with in the world, whether it's the way the Eastern man is represented in the West or, and then you've also sort of taken on this like some sort of social justice for Asian guys because they're generally not, I guess not as considered cool in the West, but then you're not doing anything yourself personally in the micro. So you look at the macro picture and you just look at who has influence and you rip apart every little piece of their story that's not like how you would imaginary do it. And, and then, then that, that creates an unhappy troll that is tweeting you. Could be, could be. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I think a lot of it is symptoms of a system that has uh, shut people down and suddenly the internet allows you to speak and you're going to like literally throw up all over it because it's the first time you're able to release this stuff. And there are, there are certain evil ones, but for the most part, a lot of it is, are symptoms of a bigger issue um, that is going on and we are very lucky that we have microphones to be able to make statements and make things that um, that can express our frustrations whereas most of the people in the world do not have that. That's why once you guys disappoint them once, yes. then it's just like, it's tragic yes. because that's all they have. I can't lie that at some point in my life there was some thought like that too, but before we had got into it and we got in attack mode and we were like, you know what, we're gonna do something about it. Um, it's easy to sit back and just stare at stuff. And, and I feel for them in that sense. Totally. And there's some people who let that eat them alive and to consume their life. And there's some people who have moments of that lashing out. And I think our job uh, as storytellers, especially as public storytellers, is to, um, one, sometimes hear it. And other times to differentiate the crazies from the non-crazies. Um, and, uh, and continue to do our thing because we're in this business. We're going to have to take the heat because we are putting things out there and that just comes with the territory, uh, especially in this day and age where everyone gets a voice. I either try to avoid, like even um, reviews and things. I didn't read a lot of reviews for Crazy Rich Asians. You did not go on Reddit. I definitely did not go on Reddit. <laughs> I definitely did not go on Reddit. Don't go there. I won't go there. Don't. But it is, a, it is a choice I made in order to know that like, people will have their issues or whatever they want to have issues. I am going to present something and hopefully it does its job of uh, making people see that we are not one thing. And then let's take the next step and have more stories and more things that present us in other ways. So. We call it a net positive. Is it an overall positive? Every Crazy Rich you can have your little bits about it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Overall positive. Yeah. Yeah. Ken Jong, I believe overall positive. Yeah. If things aren't moving, nothing is changing and evolving. Exactly. So things have to be moving at every course. And by the way, it can be the wrong move. Sometimes the wrong move is the best thing that can happen because it, the course, right. I believe yeah. in um, our progression as society and that we're all coming together. Technology is, is, is happening with or without us. Like we are all gonna face each other. And we're all gonna have to accept each other and we're gonna have to go through craziness to do that. I gotta give a shout, special shout out to Ken Jong. Ken Jong, let me open up for him. Stand up comedy. And by the way, Ken was the first person to call me when he saw the announcement. I don't, I didn't know him. I've never met him. When the announcement for Crazy Rich Asians was in the trades, he's the first person to call me. To come to my set, he was doing Dr. Ken. Sat me down. He's like, I want to help in whatever way. If that means just tweeting about it, if it means just shutting up about it, I want to support Asian American filmmakers in any way possible. Like no strings attached. Just, no strings attached. I just attached. want to boost totally. this because I believe in it. Mm -hmm. And when we asked him to be in it and have this specific role. Uh, his show had just got canceled. It was like probably the worst time to ask anybody to take a day to fly to Singapore, shoot with you for two days and fly back. And he was down. He never hesitated. Um, I'm not gonna say who else was on the stand-up tour, but some other people on the stand-up tour said no, if I could open up as a college student. And Ken said yes and pushed it through. Dude, nice. I remember he had drinks with us afterwards. We Dude, I was like, chilling with him at the bar. I was totally underage, under actually. Under but, and I was talking to, and that's the first time I asked him actually some of the first questions about his stand-up and um, what would end up being controversial. And I asked him for and I had that first talk with him like 12 years ago. So to me, I'm like, Ken's and the, cool. And then he, he addresses, to me. yeah. I always think that like, I'm like, I'm looking at Asian American, I'm looking at the youth at the colleges that we, me and Andrew tour at, we get, we get paid to speak at. And I say, I look at everybody, go, everybody here can work. A smaller percentage, but most of you guys are smart. But then I look at everybody and I kind of go, nah, I'm not gonna lie guys, a lot lower percentage of you guys that is, that is smart and has is hardworking is bold. And they're not, like you said, a shark's gotta swim or it's gonna die. I always call it pushing a boulder up a hill. The second you stop pushing the boulder up the hill, the boulder rolls back on you. Like at the end of the day, people just have to have the forward motion and not super overly analyze the forward motion. Which groups is it benefiting? Which groups is it not benefiting? Which groups is it 
not including. I, I think it's like that Bruce Lee quote, don't focus on the finger when I'm pointing to the moon because you'll miss like the glorious and beauty of the moon. Like, It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. We know we're, what we're trying to show. We know where we're headed and how we get there and how we do that, all the details like, We'll figure it out and we'll make mistakes and do it, but like, don't focus on that because then you're missing the whole end goal. We got some, we got some hot seat questions. One, what is it about Chinese Taiwanese guys from Palo Alto that want to go on and do something very macro and big? I think that the Bay Area at that time in the 80s was a place where the engineer was king and anyone could change the world. Nobody was like that rich. Nobody was like on the cover of magazines yet, but everyone was doing something and had a vision of, hey, technology can change the world. And so that, that bled into all of us. What is, uh, was there any opportunity that you felt like you missed out on or you were overlooked for because you were Asian? Did I pursue this career because I didn't think other avenues may have been open? Absolutely, for sure. In one or two sentences, what was it like to get mentored by Steven Spielberg at USC? <laughs> he discovered me, he found my shore, he bought this, uh, a pitch for me, he invited me to his set to watch him. And I owe a lot to that gesture. And also seeing somebody who's kind, that was not like some other directors out there who are like dictators on that set. Do you feel any responsibility now that you're the first Asian director who's like sort of become a you know, like a celebrity director, at least within the Asian American community. Do you feel some sense of responsibility, I guess? Uh, more now than ever, for sure. That was never a goal of mine. I was just making movies. I wanted to like express whatever I was feeling. It was during the Oscar So White and uh, starring John Cho and all those like movements that were happening. All that stuff uh, made me think more about my responsibility to the, oh, thank you, uh, both the Asian community, but also my film community to be like, if we're gonna make this thing better, what am I contributing to it? Realizing that, oh, a lot of the things that got me here were people setting those things up for me. You guys, Wong Fu, all these people who kept showing that like this can happen. I feel responsibility to that. We have a scholarship now at USC called the John M. Chu uh, Scholarship Fund, which is great for Asian making fil filmmaker there. I'm more out of a understanding of how it helped me and without those things I wouldn't have had the opportunity and how important that is for that next wave. When like people come up to you and they're almost like crazed and they grab you and they go, John, F Whitey. You showed white people don't have to be in movies. F them man, they were so mean to us. Growing up they were holding us down. Yeah. I, what's your response to that? Yeah, what is your response to that? I just, I just tell them, listen, we're all human beings and we just want to be seen and we want to know that what we say is heard by others and that it affects them in some way, good or bad, or whatever it means. And like that's the only goal. In the end of the day, we all feel out of place. We all feel like we're trying to find community. We're all trying to find connection. That's like why movies exist, because it shows that you're not alone in your struggles. I think a lot of people thought that the first guy that was gonna make like a blockbuster Asian film was gonna be Justin Lin. Yeah. Because he's kind of like prototypically that more militant yeah. Asian guy who's more like fire with fire. He did better luck tomorrow. You know what I mean? Stuff from like No, I think I think Justin is that guy still. Uh, I think Better Luck Tomorrow is, I was there at Sundance when it showed and Ebert uh, defended it in the crowd, I was there. That uh, movie affected me in a lot of ways and spoke to me in ways that I didn't understand even at the time. We'll all continue to push this forward. You were on David Chang's podcast. You guys had talked about how it was like, was it successful even beyond what you imagined? Yes, I always love my movies. I'm like, I love this movie, great movie. Right, let's, this movie. Let's put this on again. How do you deal with the new activist title that's thrust onto you, whether you ask for it or not, whether it's responsibility, whether it's a burden? It doesn't make you feel um, a weight put upon you. It makes you feel free. If you can answer this quickly, what's your main talent? Let me just say this, from compared to other directors I've met, you don't seem as in your head. You're very like you don't seem you seem super normal. You're very normal. I'm not saying you I don't have that weird. mode because I one of the biggest things that you never nobody ever talks about being a director is you have to convince people that you're a director. If they if they want to follow you and they want to work hard for you, you don't have to demand that from anybody. You don't have to uh, uh, pay people to do that for you. You can get pretty far. Uh, and 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 as a storyteller, that's kind of what you're doing. You're around a campfire and everyone's sitting there and you're like, let me tell you a story. Do you think it's true that minorities? in America have to be better than their white counterparts to achieve the same level of success. Yes, there is a stigma right now that we have to overcome every time, yeah. The audience doesn't give a f 
If a movie's great, they're gonna be there for you. It's the gatekeepers that it matters for us. I think nowadays, I think what's different is the gates are lower because uh, access to technology, again, I think it's a class thing, access to equipment, it all changes the, the paradigm of of who's allowed to speak. Right, the threshold is lower of yeah. how much better. So now the content speaks for itself. You can shoot. How, how do you get people to get to work while acknowledging that the, there may still be, obviously there's still some slight imbalance in the in the currency exchange ratio per unit of effort? I think work is work, like get to work. Like, like there, there, are, there are other people who can go fight those battles, but if you're gonna be in the creative business and you're, everything's dependent on your stories or what you make, then make the best thing. Like that shouldn't affect what you make in any sort of way. Your focus has to be 800% on that. Um, and only that, especially as a director, where there is no uh, structured path of how to get there. Um, it's all on you and the things that you make. Um, I think that that's the number one thing. You, you can't let anything take you away from making stuff. Why are you so good at making things that make people cry? Does it, your EQ um, must be yeah, so high. Your, yeah, okay. Do you just know how to put, play on people's heartstrings? Or? I definitely did a lot of wedding videos growing up. And when you do the same wedding over and over again, you realize what you can tweak to make people feel fake things. Then you actually put a character in there and you learn, I learned over the years how to make a, uh, an audience care about a character and root for that character. Two together is a very a potent weapon to be able to say, oh, you already care about this person. You already want them to win the thing and we're gonna put them in a tough situation where it's gonna make you feel something. Oh, and guess what? I'm also gonna play Celine Dion in Turn to Balcon White. And then you're like, oh, I'm gonna put, <laughs> I'm gonna put Kina Granis on top of that and I'm gonna make all the sound go away so you can't breathe for a moment And then there. they'll let the water flow and down the, the aisle. Yeah. yeah. A lot of Asian American digital media creators. We're one of them, obviously Wong Fu and them. Uh, to be honest, I think there's a, we felt like we hit a wall to some extent. Is there any advice or things you can say or an inspirational words as somebody who maybe didn't take the digital route as much, you took the traditional route, but, but what can you say to us? Because you are very supportive of us all. I mean, thanks for putting us in a movie, even though David's scene got deleted. Um, <laughs> I say be as innovative as you were when you started as you are now trying to find what that future is. Storytelling is all changing, but you clearly um, know how to tell stories, you clearly know how to entertain people, you clearly know how, who, who you're speaking to, and you can use that in all different mediums of storytelling, not just YouTube. And if our currency is uh, what we make, then the only thing you can do is keep making. One movie you would like to see made that you will personally probably never make. I think they should make Thundercats because um, I love Thundercats, but uh, and I think it should be an all Asian cast, Thundercats. What was your favorite Sichuan dish that we had today at Sichuan Impression? Um, what was my I know favorite? You didn't get to eat the crab yet. I, yeah, I haven't eaten it. I, I, think the the, I think the crab would be great. Although the ribs were freaking amazing. I just don't love to eat ribs right on camera. Right. <laughs> For all the schools out there, what can you give them? Like that is at least just one major takeaway to all the you know the kids. I'm sure they're gonna show this interview in AAS class or whatever. John, just tell us something. Whatever you say is gonna connect more deeply with me than whatever my dad tells me. The most important thing in your journey is to decide what you want out of this life. The measurements of success that lead to that. If it's being famous, it will never be fulfilled because fame is fucking wave and uh, you may not get there. If your goal in life is to um, be heard at a certain level, or to, or, or I, I want, I want a great uh, family life, then you have something to achieve, and you know that everything you do is leading to that goal. When you get swept by money, or when you get swept by uh, reputation, creative business, when we don't have a lot of things to like be stable, our inner navigational system has to be super strong, and if it's not. Um, a lot of us find the ways by, by doing a lot of bad things to get, to be forced into a navigational way. But the more, the sooner you can figure out where you want to head and how you want your life to be, the more all the obstacles go away because those are just little chapters along the way. You get to focus on the work that's going to get you there. Uh, so that's what I would say to anybody who's thinking about this. Because it's not easy emotionally. Your emotions are going to go up and down. You're going to feel like a failure. You're going to feel like a fake. By your inner being, you are, um, you can be, you know the things that will satisfy you that are attainable things and you'll be fine. One phrase for your rainbow that's gonna fly above you right here. Make stuff. Make stuff.
no matter what. Yo, John, thank you so much. I felt like you were speaking to me, partially because you were speaking to me when you said that last <laughs> monologue. I technically and was I, literally yeah, speaking to Yeah, and I felt it, it very deeply. deeply. And uh, I, got, I got to go home and think about some things. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing everything you guys have done. You guys have paved the way for so many and a lot more to go. So I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys do. You know what, it, it always means a lot when like people like you uh, say that to us because we generally kind of be like, yeah, we do YouTube, we do YouTube, we play it down. But um, yeah, we appreciate that people in Hollywood recognize, you know, so. This whole next wave of people are all people who grew up on your stuff or yeah. saw your stuff or had felt empowered by it, uh, you, you should feel an immense sense of pride of what's, what's actually about to happen. It's going to be great. I'm doing In the Heights, all Latinx cast. Um, oh, in Washington Heights. In Washington Heights. Oh, shoot. Not Hacienda Heights. No, no. <laughs> nope. In uh, Dominican. In, Dominican, yeah. Dominican, Puerto Rican territory, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Wow. And uh, in the comments below, why don't you let us know who else we should uh, meet up with? Thank you again for watching that video. Give it a thumbs up. And until next time, we out. Peace.